Sorry, I forgot to start recording. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, this. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we assume that the chamber will probably cry at the lights from the comment letter on the comment. So we'll switch to that in a second. And then the second item we wanted to bring to you is actually coming up a little bit sooner, um, which is a discussion of the uh, existing, what we call them pop up program. Those are the sort of temporary outdoor dining areas that are in the street. Um, and so, as that, as we emerge out of COVID and that program winds down, there's two policy decisions that will, will be taken to the city council. One is around the timing for actually kind of phasing out this current kind of temporary phase of the, of the program, <clears throat> but secondly, whether or not we want to move forward, the city wants to move forward with a more permanent formalized program uh, for uh, outdoor mining within the public right away in the street. So um, with that, I think I can probably turn it over to Shweta uh, to begin. Shweta, you should have access to your, uh, your PowerPoint, I'm assuming you're showing, so good morning. Good morning. Okay, let me let me go ahead and share my screen. How's that? Can everybody see that? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, good morning, everybody. Thanks again for for having us. Um, as Ellen mentioned, we're I'm here to talk about two topics. Um, I'll be presenting the first one, which is the active uses on the ground floor. Um, this was discussed by City Council on June the 1st and um, <coughs> provided some direction and we're now soliciting feedback from um, both the Chamber and the PDA in advance of taking it to the Planning Commission. Um, we intend to do that at the end of this month on July the 28th and then after that it would go back to City Council for, for final decision. Um, so with that, let me just give you a brief overview of my presentation. I'll provide some, some background. Um, I'll go over the, the existing policies as they're adopted today. Um, and then we've given some thought as to how to potentially modify them. Um, these, are, these are the topics that we want your ideas and feedback on. Um, and then I'll go over what the next steps would be after, after today. So in terms of the background, um, as many of you know, the original specific plan for downtown was adopted in the late 1980s. We did a comprehensive update in 2002 and most recently in 2019. Um, it's this 2019 plan that includes several policies related to active ground floor uses. So there's, um, there's of course the definition and the applicability of the overlay. Um, there's multi-tenant buildings. Um, of course, downtown we have a lot of buildings that aren't just one tenant. There's multiple tenant spaces within a single building. Um, and then there's the concept of multi-use spaces. So these are a single tenant space, but there's more than one use within that tenant space. Um, and then back in 2019, pre-COVID even, um, we had given some thought as to what could be some potential exceptions to the, to the overlay requirements. Um, so I'll go over those as well. And so to start, here's the existing definition for active ground floor uses. Um, so essentially an active ground floor use is one that promotes an active pedestrian environment and includes you know, uses such as retail and restaurants. Um, the task force made a very specific recommendation to council, which was, you know, which was adopted, that active uses do not include personal services. So, you know, haircut, haircutting places or nail salons would not be considered to be active uses. You know, in terms of applicability, um, so this map shows the entirety of downtown. The active ground floor uses is the purple hatched line. And it's probably a little bit hard to see maybe at, at this scale, but it's south of the Arroyo and it's this purple area that goes along either side of Main Street and then through uh, some of the parts of the existing Civic Center sites. Um, and so here's the policy that uh, refers to multi-tenant buildings. So the specific plan indicates that the requirements of the actual ground floor uses should be applied to 
to tenant spaces was frontage on Main Street. Um, so if you had a multi-tenant building where some of the tenant spaces do not front on Main Street, the requirements of the overlay would not apply. And then for multi-use spaces, um, again, this is a single tenant space with more than one type of business in there. Um, as it's written right now, the requirements of the active <coughs> overlay would apply to the first 25% of the depth of the space. Um, and then the specific plan as far as exceptions go, um, an exception could be granted for any of the reasons identified in that bulleted list. So if the space were vacant for at least six months, uh, if the tenant space had less than 10 feet of, of frontage, storefront frontage, um, and then if the tenant space is located in an existing purpose-built bank building. Um, and then a two, two sort of minor, not minor, but um, anecdotal notes here would be the exceptions granted administratively by the Director of Community Development. Um, the policy calls out that the notice would be provided to the Planning Commission, but in practice, we would provide the notice to City Council as well. Um, and then lastly, a, a non-active use that's granted an exception would not be able to be replaced with another non-active use unless another exception is granted. So there wouldn't be any grandfathering in. <clears throat> um, so here we're gonna transition to the potential modifications to the policy and code related to active uses. And again, we're, we're, we're certainly hoping for your feedback here. Um, so here are some ideas as to some potential changes to the definition. So first, the applicant proposing to occupy a tenant space that's subject to the overlay would be required to provide a written narrative. The narrative would need to identify the proposed operation of the use um, and provide confirmation that there is a point of sale system like a cash register and clarify business hours. And then the narrative would need to make clear that the use would facilitate walk-in customers and have hours consistent with typical retail or restaurant uses. Um, and then secondly, this slide summarizes the potential changes to the policy and code related to the multi-use spaces. So again, a single tenant space with multiple uses. Um, so the first change could be that the depth required for active uses be 60% instead of 25% as it's written right now. Um, another change could be to add a requirement that at least 60% of the total square footage of the tenant space be dedicated to active use. Thirdly, uh, both the depth and proportion of the square footage would be based on leasable square footage. So that would be um, a clarification that we would add to the text. And then um, also add some clarifying language that indicates a non-active use within that multi-tenant, multi-use tenant space be located in the back and so it's not prominent or highly visible from Main Street. Um, and then lastly, here are some potential changes to the exceptions. Um, so some changes in, in the language here, um, the term vacancy would be replaced with abandonment and discontinuation of use. Um, and this would be to address the, the relatively common occurrence where you know, a tenant may stop paying rent or discontinue its public facing business operation. Um, but there's a period of time where it needs to liquidate its merchandise or clear its fixtures from the space. Um, and then during that period, it could be argued that the space is not technically vacant. So we're hoping to replace the term vacant with abandonment or discontinuation of use. Um, secondly, the, the language uh, on the second bullet there says that we would, we would provide more clear examples of how, you know, evidence of, of leasing the space. Um, so this could be, you know, date stamped photographs of advertisements or posting in online forums or other publications, um, something to help indicate or document that the space in fact has been, you know, it, there's been multiple attempts made to, to uh, lease the space out. Um, and then lastly, uh, a sort of a technical uh, clarification, it would be made clear that Council would receive notification of any decision regarding an exception in addition to uh, the Planning Commission. Um, so the next steps would are, are identified here. Um, we did present this 
topic to the Downtown Association yesterday morning. Um, we're here obviously with you this morning. Um, as I indicated earlier, we're planning on taking this to the Planning Commission at the end of this month on the 28th of July. Um, and then that would facilitate uh, final review by council at some point. Um, so we've provided some discussion questions if it helps guide the discussion this morning. Um, so feel free to, to use these or we're, you know, we're happy to take any feedback that you have outside of these questions as well. Um, but specifically, do you, do you have any comments on um, the potential modifications of the definition for active ground floor uses, specifically as it relates to point of sale transactions? Uh, secondly, you know, regarding the potential modifications to the depth and the, the square footage of multi-use spaces, do you, you know, do you find that the 60% of the depth and the square footage is reasonable? Would you want a different number, 50%, 75% or something else? Um, and then more broadly, do you have any comments uh, on anything else? <clears throat> and that summarizes, I mean, if that concludes the, the formal part of my presentation, I'm happy to answer questions or, um, you know, obviously looking forward to the discussion here. So. So maybe I can just so just just to kind of reiterate, um, you know, this is these these changes are really in response to direction and discussions by the city council on the existing policy. And I know there's there's feelings on both sides as far as whether or not this policy is a good idea in general, um, whether or not it's too stringent, or too more stringent. Um, but the city council direction in general was to retain the policy that we have, and in fact. <coughs> Tighten it up some. So, so that's the that's the lens through which uh, staff has been operating and, and we're looking at um, at the requirements both around I think clarifying intent so that we have better guidance. Our decision makers have better guidance. I have better guidance when reviewing these sorts of applications. Uh, and those are some of the items that Shweta raised in terms of uh, the yeah. sort of acts to the to the policy language and sort of submittal requirements. And then generally speaking, sort of making sure that I think the, the, the desire of the council was to say, when we have these sorts of mixed businesses, what's the, what's the criteria that we can use to, uh, to, to best accomplish the goal spaces really <coughs> at function in a, in a sort of a, a truly active way and not create new holes or ways to sort of tack on a little bit of retail right in an otherwise non-active space um, to argue that you are in fact compliant. So just wanted to really frame that up a little bit more uh, in terms of the, the context around the details. That what was the fine. impetus for the sort of council to want to relook and amend this? Was um, there a specific situation I, that occurred? I can address that. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the planning commission. You and did it, Herb? No, uh, <laughs> it's, it's your no, Herb. I was on the planning commission when the real estate office down the street wanted to move to the Iron Horse <clears throat> Realty. And they actually uh, said their active use and invade 25% of their front space and put for sale signs on, on artifacts or things, art and things of Pleasanton, and they call that active use. And the planning commission said, based on our definition that we approved through the deep downtown Pacific plan, we actually had to approve that because they were meeting the goal of that mm -hmm. obligation. Mm -hmm. And, but we said, you know, it's hard to, define that so maybe we need to redefine it better so we could make sure people just don't move and then ask for forgiveness <laughs> later and people get upset so that's that's what started it was at a point there. Yeah. so it was, it was a field of an actual application that just said you know hey we, we, we just maybe need to come around tight you know tighten the rules a little bit because we're creating a loophole or something that works counter to the intent of the uh, of the policy of the I got a question for Shleta and Ellen. Uh, so the PDA, you probably gave them the same presentation yesterday or, or, yes. or the day before. That's right. What was, just so we don't duplicate, what was some of their feedback that you received? Um, well, Zach actually, I think, is in, is in the room. I'm not so maybe I'm Zach could help put, us. Him, put him on the spot. <laughs> but I'll, maybe if I can summarize it back, you can, you can correct. It's really for the PDA, um, you know, overall, I think supportive of the policy as it's included. But really, you know, I think the, the the key takeaway was, you know, we don't, we're not too hung up on the number 25, 50, 60, 75, mm -hmm. whatever the number is, but we want to make sure that it functions as a valid active use. Um, so that, that I think was the main message that we took away from, from 
from the PDA, um, at least the, the group that was in the room, PDA is going to provide some formal comments um, that we probably articulate that. <coughs> Second. Zach, do you have, is Terry or Zach, do you have any right. comments? Right. Yeah. Oh, here's Zach. Here he is. Okay. Um, I think that was well said. In in general, I would say that uh, two uh, two things. One, just for my own, because I'm new here and I'm and I've kind of walked in midstream to uh, this ongoing conversation about the Iron Horse approval and then the pre-existing policy and the possible changes is that I would say that from having talked to many, many of our members that our, our original positions that were uh, um, written and shared on this prior to my arrival were a little more militant than they are now. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the optics of the way that this unfolded are just unfortunate for the policy because I believe, if I understand it right, the, the, uh, the new tenant and the, and the landlord were moving forward on some assumptions that hadn't yet been cleared and then and then with increasing fervor, the retail component at the, that, that Jen has put into the front of the Iron Horse Realty space, you know, it now probably uh, complies. It's, it's a home decor kind of a, of a shop there, but it kind of evolved. And so the optics of it just unfolded in the most unfortunate way. Um, and the more that we've thought about it in our group, we're sort of agnostic about whether you leave this depth requirement at 25 or want to increase it some or a lot or, or whatever, but as long as, the surface of Main Street to a pedestrian is 100% legitimate. Hmm. Uh, that, that's, I think our comments have kind of been misunderstood. We don't need the depth to be 100%. It could be 25 as long as the facing on the street to a pedestrian is in fact a bona fide retail uh, engagement for the, for the uh, pedestrian public. That's, that's what we're most concerned with. And I think adding the narrative and adding some of those hallmarks like having either a cash <laughs> register or other more modern form of uh, point of sale that you can actually transact business in the space. We don't have to tell them what their business hours are, but they do have to have sort of customary business hours for that kind of a business. Uh, so that, you know, when people walk by, they have a chance to do something in the space that's, that's reasonable and is explained in the narrative. So I, I'm, I'm uh, going on longer than I intended to, but basically we're agnostic as to the depth requirement as long as there's a tightening up of the <laughs> language and the uh, direction that the council is giving to the planning commission and the uh, staff on how to ensure that the retail component of a mixed use is not just a, a bolt on that's there so that the non-active use can take place in the space. It needs to be a sort of self uh, it needs to be justified on a freestanding basis. If, regardless of what the non-active use would be behind it, it needs to be legitimate up front. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Brad, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, you're muted. Oh, there you go. Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, Ellen, thank you very much for coming out from Oakland. I hope there wasn't uh, too much traffic from Oakland to Pleasanton. Uh, I work in Pleasanton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, a comment and then a question. The comment is uh, your definition of retail uses seems a little narrow. Certainly, uh, nail salons, barber shops, liquor stores create a lot more foot traffic than an art studio or a craft studio. So you might want to consider broadening your definition of active uses. And then I have a hypothetical question for you, Ellen. You and your husband own a piece of uh, own a house that you rent out for income. You've had you've owned it five to ten years. You had a good tenant who, for one reason or another, had to move out. The local government says you can only rent to a Japanese family. In the first month, you have a Caucasian family, a Mexican family, and a black family that all want to rent your house. You cannot rent it to them. In the meantime, your mortgage. Sure. Your property taxes, your utilities, your landscape uh, maintenance all continue. How would you and your husband feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, Brad, you're getting to the, to the heart of, of, of the policy debate, right? Which is to say, 
you know, regulation is there to achieve a certain intent and outcome. Mm -hmm. um, the, the adoption of the active ground floor policy was a much debated, it's probably one of the most hotly debated <coughs> topics in mm -hmm. the downtown plan, maybe mm -hmm. other than yep. high, the height of buildings, I think by yeah. second, second or second, uh, 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 falling shortly behind it. Um, and there was a lot of discussion and debate about that, about tying the hands of property owners and that balance uh, between making sure we don't have spaces to think in and that we don't overburden or cause hardship to business and property owners. So, you know, that that's the very, I would say, the heart, the heart <coughs> of the policy debate. At this point, the council is, continues to be supportive of the policy. Um, and that may be a, a discussion that we have in the future point as to whether or not it's too too drastic, it's causing too much vacancy in downtown. But the goal when the policy was crafted was to try and strike a balance of, you know, not six months was, was sort of picked as a number that was <coughs> long enough, but not too long, not too short, right, to, to avoid, to try and get an act in. And the same thing with the scope of regulation. And these sorts of, of uh, provisions around the edges that allow some flexibility and these sorts of exceptions but also there to try and reduce hardship. So the pendulum may be swinging a little bit in terms of the opinion of the of the council, at least that we've heard towards a little bit more on the regulation side. And that's just, that's that's the direction the staff is currently working with. But we, have, we understand we understand the, the, the question and the point and the debate there, correct? Thank you. So thank you, but how, but how would you and your husband feel about such a regulation? It's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I I'll, I'll just speak for we. I live in Oakland, and the city of Oakland is maybe just did it adopted. If you're all familiar with the accessory dwelling unit debate, yeah. oh. adopted regulations that say you can't build. I'm sorry, adopted regulations say you can't build an ADU on your property in the Oakland Hills because of, of you know traffic and fire danger, yeah. and that constrains our ability to use our property. You know, and so <clears throat> any such constraint of course, the property owner is a is, is somewhat of a burden. Um, so that's the balance of, of private property rights versus I think the overall goal of, of downtown to <clears throat> be a place for the community that's, that's active and vital <clears throat> and has great pedestrian, great shops and shopping and great pedestrian, uh, great pedestrian environment. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Brad. Uh, I'm going to just go around the screen first for questions. Laura has your hand up and then we'll, we'll make the room here. So, Laurie, it's all yours. Yeah, real quick, um, Ellen, are there are there other jurisdictions kind of in the 680 corridor, Tri Valley area, that have these kind of restrictions on their on their downtown? <coughs> Question number one, and and if if there are some, how are they working out for those property owners and those downtowns? Are they are they doing what they're intended to do, or are they just a burden, like you know Brad was saying, to the property owner? And then secondly, if Oakland really did just enact no ADUs in the Oakland Hills, they're going to get trumped by state law. So you're not going to have a problem with that. But anyway, that's an aside. In answer your, to your question, the answer is yes. There's many communities throughout the state and elsewhere who have adopted these sorts of active ground floor use requirements. Um, I believe that Livermore has, has requirements along similar lines. Um, and I'm sure we might have more examples off the top of her, her head. Um, but you know, we looked at those examples when this policy was being formulated. Um, so that we were really following, you know, best practices and good examples. Um, you know, there are some cities who have, I think, particularly during COVID, rolled back some of their requirements and said, you know what, ton of vacancy, restaurant, you know, businesses going out, um, going under. We really want to populate our downtowns again, um, and so have have relaxed rules or, or temporarily suspend <clears> them. <throat> um, and and the and the challenge is that once you know when 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 uses change and a business moves in, they're often there for you know for for a long time, right? Yeah. So it's so there's a, a stickiness that happens relative to business <clears throat> occupying space, and the goal is to ultimately get to the right. Like, <clears throat> so, uh, Shweta, did you have other examples of? Um, active ground floor use cities. I, I'm, 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 I think that off the top of my head, I'm uh, not uh, thinking of any, but I, I know, I know that they do exist. Right. Yeah. Um, Danville has such a policy in place. Um, Dan Rafael does also, and there were a handful of other ones that we had provided examples of to the task force. 
several years ago when, when this was the topic of debate, um, but I don't remember the rest of them off the top of my head. What's interesting about Danville, Shweta, is that, um, I don't know if, if, if anybody here knows Charlie's in Danville. It's a barber shop that's been rated, you know, no more in barber shop in the Bay Area from the survey for years and years and years. It's like an anthill of activity. My husband used to get his hair cut there and it was like a churn of foot traffic in and out. People come in, they check in, they go get a coffee, they come back, they go to lunch. I mean, it was such a, it's such a driver of foot traffic. I'm curious um, on the, you know, if we're comparing to some of those other, other, other similar towns that have these things, do they also have the restrictions on um, hair and nails? <clears throat> I believe Livermore does. They restrict personal service uses on ground floor spaces in certain key locations within downtown. So some some do and some some don't. I think the answer to your question. Uh, there was a very deliberate decision made during the DSP process to exclude personal service uses from that list and definition, and that was you know policy decision of the, the task force, planning commission, and council and the town. Lori, is that uh, anything else? Um, I'd like to follow up on that. Okay. <clears throat> As you all know, who know me, I'm passionate about downtown, had a, a business downtown for decades, and it was right next door to Norm's <clears throat> Barbershop. <clears throat> I, I didn't know it when I moved in, but I loved being next door to Norm's Barbershop <laughs> because all these gentlemen would come in and it is exceedingly active more active than <clears throat> some of the new businesses. I'm thrilled that that upholstery shop has opened up. But I bet Norm's is 10 times busier than the upholstery shop. So I have a real problem with the definition of, of uh, active uses. And I think if you look at real estate in Pleasanton these days, it's pretty active. So um, I have a very big problem with the definition of active and would like to see that reviewed. Can I ask a question? Uh, Mike Madden, you're a stakeholder. I'd love to get your feedback on what you think active use is for your buildings. I, I think uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Brad and Jan. I think a, a barbershop, I mean, the idea when when we did the, the 2002 uh, downtown update, I'm sorry, the 19, the earlier one, the, uh, when Michael Friedman came in and gave the the presentation of, you know, you want shops, you want doors, windows, doors, windows, doors, windows, and you just want that activity. And, um, you know, and a barber shop would, would certainly, uh, you know, generate more foot traffic on a daily basis than, a, than an art studio. Um, I was just recently down in uh, Carmel and on Ocean Avenue, the window that gets, the windows that get the most people staring at them is the windows with the houses and the prices and, and the real estate. The real estate. Yeah. yeah. So a real estate office in, in on ocean Avenue in Carmel qualifies um, as that. And if you've paid attention to the housing prices in Pleasanton in the last three months, I'll bet you a real estate window um, would, would get more people stopping in front of it than, than a lot of uh, a lot of active uses. But um mm -hmm. You know, that said, the, the only other thing that I would, um, you know, it's hard. I mean, it, it's hard. Uh, Livermore, when, when you bring up Livermore uh, in this conversation, please acknowledge that Livermore as a city has invested tens of millions of dollars into yeah. their downtown. And so it's kind of a quid pro quo. Um, you know, they want to tell you, you know, they, they do have these policies, but they stand back and they let you do what you have to do. And they're investing huge sums of money into their downtown, the likes of which Pleasanton hasn't done in a quarter of a century or, or ever. And um, so, you know, as a property owner, if the city were uh, doing more active things to improve the environment, um, you know, maybe these things wouldn't come down the pipeline as, as seeming, you know, penal and trying to hamper our abilities to uh, rent our spaces, but, um, you know, anyway, so if you want to compare it to Livermore, please compare it in the fact that look, I mean, look what their, look what kind of investment they've put into their downtown versus what we uh, <clears throat> haven't done. Um, and anyway, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my take. Um, you know, that's what, that's what got me on the zoom call. 
Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good point, Mike. Very good Mike, point. good morning. Gary Schweigerly here. Um, what's the, do you have any vacancy in the downtown Main Street, First Street? Uh, how is the difficulty getting that rented? We are, we're vacant at the Pleasanton Hotel. Um, and that, I mean, anyway, that's kind of unique. We're not going to, um, you know, it's, it's a restaurant. It's a big restaurant. We're currently subdividing it. Um, so we're going to create two kind of restaurant spaces where there were, where there was just the, the big one. So um, anyway, and we're, we're having success with that. We've, we've got, we're pretty close on one side of it. And, um, and once we get it subdivided, we're confident that we'll, we'll get the other side leased. But this, uh, you know, these are restaurant spaces and, and we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna do anything, uh, you know, off of that. Yeah. Can I jump in? So anyway, in, in my I, last six years, I managed a two-story office building in Livermore, ran it six years, 100% occupied, getting rented before they even were vacant. And now I have one space vacant a year and a half, 1500 foot ground level COVID. Um, <clears throat> so that's like 20% vacant. San Luis Obispo vacancy on 3,700 feet. Can't find a good user to fit with the zoning and the parking requirements. Um, I'm putting my house up for rent if anybody wants to get Angela and Peter Street. Um, 1800 foot, <laughs> make a deal. Um, <laughs> is that commercial or residential? Actually, my wife, we got friends that want to rent it for 3500, but I, I threw it in the real estate thing for 4900 and see, got to get these high prices. But anyway, so the conclusion is I think coming out of COVID, I've got space and not pleasant in office space for rent, nothing, it's just dead. The office and Jack confirmed the last meeting, office space is dead. So I'm thinking throw all zoning out the window for two years coming out of COVID. You can put whatever, anybody you can find and try to get some vitality in economy back into paying rents. Um, so that's that's my thing. Throw the zoning out for two years. Anybody else like that idea? <laughs> <laughs> Property owner's perspective. Yeah. So uh, is there anybody uh, on the Zoom call that has any questions or comments before we move to the table here uh, in, in our office? I don't see, let's let me go through here. No one's raising their hand. Um, okay. Terry, uh, do you have any comments being the, the chair of the downtown Pleasant Association? No? Okay, she's muted. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, move move to the table here, I guess. Is there any comments from anybody? Any feedback? I mean, uh, I, Nancy, yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to comment on uh, Steve Madison, and, uh, and it has to do with the parks. It has to do with enhancing the downtown. And absolutely, I mean, I think I, I've seen some of the plans for the, the, uh, the little bridge at the one end of town, you know, how, how it would be enhanced. The city has something in a plan somewhere that you know shows how it would be beautified and the entrance to Pleasanton would be beautified and you know uh the park you know on first street and there are all sorts of things you know to enhance uh the downtown that probably would definitely affect the businesses on the other hand i think i mean i'm not a business owner but it seems to me these days in working with our own personal business that uh, you have to be more specific with people because they push, they push the limits. Uh, and I think it, it's happening probably across the board in, in anything you try to do, uh, you know, whether you're trying to contract in, for your own home or whatever, the limits are really pushed. And so you have to be very specific. So I think, you know, being specific on whatever regulations you have, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> These days, uh, you know, it's not like it was you know, 30, 40 years ago. So anyway, that's my answer. Sharif, you always have comments about uh, thoughts, uh, being on the Economic Vitality Committee with me. Well, also, yeah. And also living downtown, yeah. uh, which is great. This is a great conversation, so I got up early. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so, so two things. The, the Iron Horse is an example of something where, where it strikes me that maybe the letter of the law was complied with, but the spirit of the law was really violated. And I think that's why people 
myself and took offense. So wait a minute, we have another real estate office. And, and the, 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 the symptom of that or what you see is this, just look at the signage. Yep. It's real estate, big and knickknacks, little. Yep. So I, I think uh, I would just ask that city council look at having signage be part of this thing as well. So you don't get into that unintended consequence. Uh, where okay, where it's fifth, whether it's 25, 50, or 60, but then they have a you know a big sign for what the, the, the back of back system. of the house is, right? Versus the front. And, right? and a, kind of a bigger, a bigger issue that is not being addressed by this is I'll just call it saturation or oversaturation, because I don't know a better term. And I'm not like Gary, you know, does this for a living, but it seems like if you have at some point you're gonna have too many of a certain category of business, whether it's a real estate office or a, a, a nail or hair salon, or even a barber shop. And there's an economic consequence if you have too many of something, someone's gonna suffer. So I guess the, the question is, that, are there any cities that have addressed oversaturation that they put in their zoning that we're trying to target to have so many of a certain kind of business relative to the size of the population? And I ask that as a question, yeah. I, I don't know. They sure do. There are yeah, I think that yeah, it does exist. It does. Uh, it's it's challenge it's challenging to implement, right? Because you're sort of, of saying, you're like, okay, we've got off the five whatever we we want or don't want, and anybody else that comes through the door has to wait. So you know, it can be hard to a fairness and administrative <clears throat> administrative piece of that, that that can be difficult. To run. Yeah. Wait, we did that with the banks on Main Street. Oh, why was it? Both ways. Yeah, yeah. Right. both ways. Right. The pendulum swing, yeah. right? The pendulum yeah. swing. Yeah. 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 I guess I'd ask a question. Mike, you brought up the great point as uh, what cities can do to create the vitality in their town. And I know Pleasanton right now, we're adding 176 parking spaces at the uh, south end. And we got the, the Pleasanton uh, the Firehouse Art Center. And I'm trying to think, what else? Do we need more parking up near Pleasanton Hotel? Or what's, what is more, can we ask the city to get out of this if they're going to put a bunch of ordinances in? Um, that, I mean, that's a great question. I guess I was disappointed when the Bank of America building came up for sale and the, um, uh, and the city didn't move aggressively toward purchasing that. Um, yeah. you know, for, for, and, a parking lot. Is that what you're for whatever, I mean, just, yeah. just, just buy it and figure it out. I mean, you got to move aggressively at some point you got to, you know, it's like walking out of the title company, the first house you bought. You know, you walk out of there and you're like, how in the hell are we going to afford this? And then yep. five years later, you're looking at, you're laughing at yourself. But it's that, I mean, they, they just, yeah. the, <laughs> Dr. Long's, you know, Dr. Long's lot came available. That's right in the hardest center of town. I mean, that could have been 25, 30 spaces. Yep. Um, I did, the city's just, Livermore has moved aggressively over the last 25 years and Pleasanton has not. And it, so being, you know, having uh um, or is in both waters, it's, it's kind of frustrating. Um, you know, when I got started in Livermore, uh, you know, I got laughed at. People thought, people told us that, you know, oh, you're, you're doing business in downtown Livermore. You know, what, that's, you know, you're never going to be, um, you know, you're never going to be what we have here in Pleasanton. For crying out loud, I was the president of the PDA board um, <laughs> at the same time. And here we are, you know, 15 years after that, and um, I mean, drive, anyway, drive the downtowns, drive the downtowns at 7.30 at night. Um, Livermore is what, <clears throat> Liver, I mean, the, Livermore is what we wanna be. And that 25 years ago, I would have been laughed at at a 7.30 meeting saying that. Um, right. You know, oh yeah, I got Dom surplus. <laughs> um, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know, it, it, it's, it, it's a frustration that the, uh, that you know, Pleasanton has um, you know passed up on some opportunities here, and uh, um, many anyway. And it, it yeah, it's just it, it is. It's frustrating, and then and then you know, and then to not be uh, you know, I know Jan was a part of the downtown specific plan, uh, but no other property owner was you know. I mean, I, I attended some of the early meetings. Uh, Craig Semmelmeyer did. Chris Bratless did. The property owners, and it was. It felt like we weren't uh, uh, like we weren't really uh, welcome in in the setting, and uh, you know I, I don't have any specifics to, uh, to to back that up. It was a feeling, and and then what comes out of it is you know what we can or can't do with our property. So um, 
anyway, so those, those are kind of the frustrations. And, and Herb, to answer your question, uh, you know, I don't have a specific, um, you know, traffic and parking is a, uh, uh, you know, is, a, is, a, you know, is an issue that, that we, you know, convenience, um, you know, people come down, you know, again, when I was on the PDA board, we used to talk about all the events and people, we would attract people for the events, but by definition, the events are when thousands of people are trying to get downtown. And that's the only time they get downtown that month and they leave with, you know, the parking, the, you know, the parking issues. Well, yeah, it's a first Wednesday street party. It's hard to park, you know, by definition. Um, so so there's, a, there's a parking perception problem um, on top of the parking reality problem. Um, Anyway, but but like I said, I, I don't really have a specific um, thing. You know, the Bank of America one was frustrating, um, and and basically other than that, just the lack of uh, kind of aggressiveness. Uh, you know, when these opportunities did present themselves. Great, thanks, Mike. Any other uh, comments for Ellen? We have another subject matter, so I want to make sure we're moving along. Any other, uh, Mr. Baker? Yeah, I just have one question. I mean, it sounds like what we're trying to do is prevent sham businesses from being in the front part of any kind of operation downtown. And it's not clear to me that 25% or 50% or 75% is necessarily the most effective way to do that. Um, maybe there's, and this is probably going to be controversial and open up another whole can of worms, but maybe there's some economic basis to, to do that. Maybe there needs to be a certain amount of sales generated or sales tax generated. And I'm not sure how you would calculate that specifically, but to prevent a sham business, I think if you have some kind of economic um, hurdle, might be a more effective way than saying we need a certain amount of footage because you could have the footage, but if it's a sham business and it does no business and you've met the requirement, you're not going to stop it. Whereas if you've got some kind of economic incentive uh, or economic threshold, um, and maybe it's you no, know, you have to generate X amount of sales tax or you need to make that payment. Um, then I think it puts a little bit more teeth in it. But as I said, I think that opens up a whole nother can of worms and makes this a much more complicated issue. But I think it sort of gets at the heart of what we're trying to stop. So I just throw that out there, not knowing how to actually implement it or what the consequences of doing something like that would be. Yeah, Steve, Jan, and I were all on the economic or on the downtown SIP plan committee and uh that was our biggest issue was how do you you regulate what an active use is what's the definition of an active use is it the gym people coming and going they're active they're walking in and out of the door or is it a cash register like the books the town center books and so from my standpoint it's just how do you define active use the 25 yep. percent 50 75 percent floor space doesn't really mean anything but to us yeah, it's agreed. it is it really generating a purpose? And when we did the the Iron Horse, we actually talked about them having to create a separate business license and a tax ID number for their retail segment. And I don't know if they did or didn't, but uh, that's the way to measure it because they'd have to send in a tax uh, uh, business license report. Yeah, and okay. they have two employees and they make ten grand a month or um, a year or something. So yeah. those were just two ways to do it without getting into the square footage thing. So just a thought. Helen, do you have any more questions no, for us? No, I really, really helpful feedback both from the uh, Zoom, the Zoom group <laughs> and from the, from the table. So um, we will we'll take those comments. Um, and again, if the chamber is obviously invited to submit more formal comments, if you want to sort of gather up the the, the discussion today into something that's um, in written form, uh, happy to include that as part of our correspondence to the, the Planning Commission when it goes on the 28th. 28th of this month? Correct. Yeah. Thank you. So you'll see a staff report uh, next week. Yeah, I mean, I think in closing this discussion for this topic is the Chamber's been got on record is we never supported the active use policy. We didn't feel it was, um, uh, the, we thought business should be determining and the economic situation should be determining what 
<clears throat> excuse me, goes in that space, not, not policy, zoning. And so it's been a difficult one for us to swallow but we're willing to work with it. Um, but again, what I think our whole focus should be that we wanna allow flexibility for the tenants and the owners of those buildings that, that they can get in there and, and provide act, active uh, activity downtown. So, and I know that's not what you wanna hear, but that's really, a, I, that's, you know, that's, yeah, that, that's, our, that's been our position for the beginning. Um, so anyway, I just wanna close with that. Um, and why don't we move into to the parklet discussion, sure. which is certainly a hot topic uh, in San Francisco yes. the last couple of days. I know. <laughs> I was just to the radio my way of yeah, today. I know. we're talking about it. In those right. Um, so as I mentioned at the um, at the beginning, um, we're bringing a, a policy I'm bringing a policy discussion to the city council uh, on July the twentieth um, for about the existing. Um, we're calling the pop-up program, which is sort of the, the temporary outdoor dining areas that we allowed for uh, during uh, during COVID, um, and the, the the recommended timing for for phasing out of that program. Um, just so you all are aware, we we implemented this um, at the you know spring of, or summer of last year uh, as a program to really enable businesses to take advantage of the street to expand outdoor dining, in particular given the restrictions that were in place at the at that time on, on indoor. Um, the city very deliberately took a pretty light touch with the, the permitting, the requirements, um, sort of said, you know, here's some broad parameters, make sure they're safe, get an inspection if you've got a, you know, a, a tent or some kind of canopy, but we're not gonna tell you, you know, some, some very you know, broad guidelines around sort of upkeep and maintenance, but not a whole lot of strict rules about aesthetics and things like that. So um, all of those owners, have been um, on notice to some extent that that program will ultimately come to an end. Um, at this point, most of those business owners are aware that will be aware that we've recommended uh, September the sixth as the date by which the the, uh, the pop up program will end, and so um, that's time to coincide with the end of the weekend on May um, event, which is also scheduled to wind down then. Um, and that to, to, to staff at least seemed like a logical um, time to phase out the program. Um, the reasons for the phase out, um, we, although I, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that the restaurant owners love these, <laughs> love the pop ups. Yeah. I think they're, I think they're popular mm -hmm. with their, their patrons. Um, and, you know, I think in general it's been a, been a really successful program and a, and a lot of welcome relief <laughs> for the restaurant, <clears throat> restaurant owners. Um, however, um, the aesthetics of these pop-ups have been a little bit challenging. You know, the city hasn't, hasn't you know, taken a very strong hand in saying, hey, it's got to look like X or Y, so therefore it's a little about ad hoc. Um, a lot of a wide range of standards in terms of how attractive or sort of well-maintained these things are. Um, they, they do take up parking, so we, I think, have um, probably at least a dozen up to, you know, or, or more of, of these up and down Main Street, and each one of them occupies two to three parking spaces. So as we see uh, traffic returning to, to Main Street and more normalized uh, retail and, and business operations, we're just starting to see more concern, particularly from retailers, about the loss of parking adjacent um, to, their, to their storefronts, walking to views of those storefronts, and so um, the time seems to be here to, to phase that out. And so staff is recommending, we'll be recommending to the council that September 6th be the date that that program come to an end. Um, the council may want to offer something different in terms of a longer time frame. Um, the PDA was certainly interested when we brought this discussion to them yesterday and having it extend potentially as long as through the end of the year um, to coincide with things like down in kind of fair being in town and also bringing more people to downtown. Um, Continuation of the, of the uh, weekend concert series through the through the through the fall as well. Um, so that's one piece of it. And then the second piece is um, understanding that this temporary program, you know, will will come to an end. Um, we're bringing a policy question to the council as to whether or not the city uh, should um, bring back something that would, would be a more long term and formal program. So as you know, a lot of cities are saying, "Hey, we you know we love this this outdoor dining." traffic calming, business opportunity, pedestrian vitality, all of these things. We want to make this a longer term program. And so they, they've allowed for much, much a more formal program into the long term. Um, you all probably recall a couple of years ago, we had um, a 
what we call a parklet, which was like a little um, prefab structure that was situated on um, across from the Pete's Coffee um, and, and occupied some parking spaces there. Um, actually got a pretty good amount of use from the cafe patrons, from, from, from Pete's, from other folks. It's a public space with tables and chairs, <laughs> um, not dedicated to a particular business. Um, some of the interest that we've heard in the long-term program is actually to make the parklets be what I would call private parklets, right? So that a restaurant would have, create their own structured space and that they would offer table service, but it really be reserved for their patrons, much like the park that the pop-ups are today. Um, that sort of a program, while we understand the advantages for restaurants, is, is difficult to administer, I would say, just because um, a few things. One, you know, <clears throat> you're occupying public space for private use, um, you're taking up parking. And if there's a proliferation of, of these pop ups, um, that you, know, you do have an impact on the cheapness of your own parking, um, down, parking supply downtown, which is always a, a concern. And so staff is not recommending. Is not recommending coming forward with that with that formal program, but if there's an, an interest in the council in, in doing anything, um, we would be most supportive of a unlimited scale public park that program, sort of a little bit more along the lines of what was in place before. More of those types of structures, whether they're sponsored by the city, whether they're kind of joint venture between uh, businesses who might see an advantage to uh, sponsoring or having one of these in public right of way. Um, so that that really is is. The, the recommendation that at this point we were intending to bring to city council on the 20th and so we wanted to get the input of, of this group and folks joining us by zoom <clears throat> on both uh that timing question um and then as well if there's any you know sort of the gauge or, or get your comments on a longer term more formal uh, part of the program um in any in any form you know to get, to get that <clears throat> So you'll be surprised to hear I have a comment. <laughs> as a as a long time, very long time, 47 year resident of downtown and business owner downtown, parking has been an issue forever. Um, I uh, come from uh, my son-in-law is a chef. I understand the restaurant end of the business and I'm thrilled for the restaurants that this is good for them. But I suggest that I like your timing at September 6th, and I suggest that not a single part would go out until the city builds a parking structure. When the city builds a parking structure, then you can consider a parklet. But until then, but going along with what uh, Mike said, um, we need some investment downtown by the city. All we get are regulations. All we get are restrictions. Let's get some investment. I think Lori, Lori um, has her hand up. So Lori, go, uh, please, you have the floor. So it, um, it's, I'm just going to offer my personal perspective. I don't know if I even have a question in here, but I know for my husband, we've lived in town for 30 years. Our business is in town. Um, we go downtown predominantly to, to have a nice dinner or lunch out. We go shopping downtown as an adjunct activity to that. We rarely go downtown to go shopping without having some kind of a food destination. Growing up in a cold climate, which I've parked myself back in since COVID, we choose our restaurants based on can we eat outside, quite frankly, unless there's some overriding consideration to something so special that we'll eat indoors. We, we value that California climate so dearly because we didn't have it um, through our younger years that the ability to eat outside on the sidewalk in a, in a patio, something else is what drives our, our dining decisions. So I think there's, you know, there, there's gotta be a nuanced approach to this. We will park blocks away. If the environment is active and enjoyable to walk through, there's actually ULI studies on this, how far people will walk in a downtown environment, if it's vibrant and active, and there's, there's things to look at and there's a texture where they wanna park right in front of the health club or the grocery store and they get really cranky if they can't. It, it's an interesting dynamic about parking versus the activity. So I, I think the city's, you know, this, this should have more conversation. It's a very nuanced opportunity and potential downside as, as Jan was just mentioning for the parking. But it, I, I would hope that the city would say, hey, you know, this worked really well. 
Maybe we need to have a lottery system and lease a parking stall. I don't know what it is, but I think there's value in exploring what were the really great things that could come out of this and not just end it and say, well, that was for COVID and we're just going to go back to business as usual, because I think we're all seeing business is not as usual. It has changed. The people have changed. And we have to reflect in our own companies and our own environments that coming out of COVID, the people have changed. And we want our businesses, our environments, our downtown, our city to reflect the people. So not really a question, just more of a perspective. Thank you, Lori. Anybody else in uh, the room or on Zoom that would like to comment? Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll jump in. So my history goes to back to with Jan. We moved downtown in 1990, lived in a house, ran the business, tried to do retail, wanted to do bed and breakfast and buy the bed you slept in and had all these dreams. Um, so I was on the 92 downtown with Dorothy Springer and Pete McDonald and we would review the documents and the flex space. And it was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I've been a parking advocate. It's inconvenient for me to have to drive around to get to my job. And um, so anyway, my 20-year-old, uh, who's a Cal Poly student, straight-A kid, even in college, it's like, oh, this street, I, I wanted to open up. He's like, Dad, this is the greatest thing to shut off. They ought to shut off Main Street permanently to allow this. So it's like we had talked about it before, closing off Main Street, making it kind of a mall. At least we got to keep St. John to drive through. Um and so now this is a great time to really talk about, okay, now you could transition easily and keep St. John, which one do we keep Rose Avenue is for traffic. Um, but, you know, the concept was coming around from Peters or railroad and get into the parking lots downtown. And then you have this mall kind of, so people are really open to it. If you want to do that, now's a good time to foster that before you tear it all out and worry about getting rid of it. Um, so anyway, that's uh, some input. Not everybody's into it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jerry, yeah. Jerry, uh, how about something like Santa Cruz, where it's a one-way street, just down the center, and then they have the outs that you can the pop out for dining and that. And so we can make beautiful art, and you make Peters one way and Maine the other way. Yeah. It's that that mm -hmm. concept has been looked at and suggested many times over the years. Um, ultimately, um, city traffic engineer has has not recommended for it. It it tends to um, increase vehicle speeds, mm -hmm. and so the, and, and it's it, it's not it's not convenient, right? So because people you can only approach a business in one direction, yeah. So it comes with some uh, some issues from a circulation perspective that aren't necessarily a first class what you might it sure be like Santa Cruz. So, yeah, Santa. It, 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 it may work <clears> in some <throat> context. It's never been endorsed by <throat> our, our sort of expert staff. I, I just got to say, I don't think you talked to a traffic engineer to come up with a perfect plan for downtown. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, since we're talking about downtown, <clears throat> I want to recommend that everyone on this call and in this room get their gas at the gas station downtown. Yeah. <clears throat> if you want to support downtown, you buy your gas there. The, I buy all my gas there. She almost went bankrupt the first time it was closed in March of 20. And then she went to council with a wonderful suggestion um, of modifying the uh, traffic flow and making Main Street open all the way to St. Mary in one direction south, of uh, putting barriers in the middle, and then you could still get into her gas station. And the bridal shop loved it. The bank loved it. There's only an entrance off of, for US Bank off of Main Street, that whole thing definitely eases the traffic flow for all of downtown residents. Um, and she had a problem and she came up with a solution that I thought was terrific. And the city poo-pooed it. They said, no, they could, that you couldn't do that. Since then, I've eaten at pastas downtown and there are diners three feet from cars mm -hmm. going down the middle of the week, but they say that they can't do that on the weekends. So I think we need to look at options and be open and look at suggestions and help those 
businesses downtown that are not restaurants. So just another on the parklet, two things. One, uh, when the fair is going on, October 11th, is it? No, it? no, it's October. October. Last two weeks. Yeah, last, last two weeks in October. October. Yeah. I think, I, I don't know what the economics <clears throat> is, but the downtown restaurants all do well, and hopefully the retailers do. I don't know. No, the retailers don't do well. Don't they don't do well. Okay. So um, that was just a question if we had a, like for one weekend open on Main, one during the fair was, was one idea. The other one was if in long term the parklets it's a city property they're putting their parklets on what if uh, we charge that the city charged an in lieu fee to see if it's worth it for the restaurant to get to pay to open that parklet to make enough money to justify the extra seating space and then tie the in lieu fees to a future parking garage or future bank of america purchase um, so then it's up to the business to decide if they want to versus the government telling them what they can and can't do. So just a thought. Well, from a hospitality perspective, you cannot have a parklet if it is not directly in front of your operation. Right. You're not going to be able to walk down the street and service. Clients. So it's better for so. the business to take an invested interest in the parklet. Like, oh yeah, I mean, that place could stay there for years the way he's built it. <laughs> but will he pay for the extra space for his seating? I, I don't know if it's worth it. But Depends on the price. That's what the question is. <laughs> and like the, the price of the loss of the parking space. We used to have a value in planning. Of, value to get yeah. It's so much a, a year right. of the parking space that we charge. When we put the Starbucks in down there, we charged them. I can't remember what it was, six grand of yep. space or something. Mm -hmm. But um, just a thought. If you mm -hmm. want to, instead of telling them they can't, say, here's an option if you want to. But we build the garage and pay off the debt with those fees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, exactly. and then the retailers are getting a benefit out of the parklet space also. So just a thought. Any com more comments from our Zoom uh, attendees? I don't see any hands <clears> up <throat> or uh, so. Um, Anybody else around the table? Any other comments well, about the, the only thing I would want to comment yeah. on is aesthetics mean everything to me, mm -hmm. and it looks like crap downtown. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It has Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. shanty. It's a shanty. It looks like yeah. Yeah. So I want to be clear: if the city, you know, were, oh, were to move, yeah, it would, it would it would include design standards, Colors. possibly sort of pre-approved designs, a couple, couple of ways you could go, but yeah, to make well, sense. I haven't, had it, yeah. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to look at <clears throat> what Pleasanton downtown restaurants received part of the RRF funding, but if they did, they can use that money toward improving space in front of their property. So, you know, if something like what Herb says became a possibility, Anybody who got some of that money would be able to invest it in something that would look nice with <clears throat> restrictions from the architect. Mm -hmm. And I like the eased restrictions when COVID started and thought it was a good idea, but that's why I support your September 6th. We need to clean up downtown. But just, uh, <clears throat> we've had it pleasant in the city plan progress. Sometimes I think it's planned obsolescence. The 86 downtown parking plan, specific plan was great. And the um, 92, and all, we had all these large parking sites designated, and Milfinger got listed, lifted to buy it. The uh, Baroni's, that law got sold. Rathbone's piece, <clears throat> the acre behind the cheese factory got sold. Yeah. Um, you know, the lot where there was going to be alignment that got sold, and Chirka built his building. Um, <clears throat> Semmelmeyer got approval to build that building. Uh, what do we call it? Um, got by the, next to B of A. Mm -hmm. And part of that, and I was at the council meeting, they said, Oh, we have an agreement with B of A for parking. Well, I said, I got up and I said, There better be an escrow that you have that guarantee in writing. A month later, oh, we don't have an agreement with B of A, and they still went ahead and built the building. I've been supporting a five-story parking structure on the Bank of America parking lot across the street from my house. Yeah, I'd like to look at a five-story parking building. I think it'd be great. <laughs> yeah, and you're putting in 40 million? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, we we'll call it a swaggerty structure. If you, keep, <laughs> if you keep letting the land go, it's never going to happen. Right, right, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, my comment, uh, just from personal, unfortunately, I don't see any real re restaurant tours on this call because they're probably just looking <clears> out. You're looking at one here. Yeah, oh, well, 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 I mean, it. yeah, but not downtown is what I was referring to. Um, and we recently had some discussions with them about the delivery fees that uh, DoorDash is charging and whatnot, and that uh, coming to an end with the city's ordinance. And they're still struggling. I mean, they're, they're, they have not come close to making up for all of the challenges that they have had to live through over the last uh, 15 months. So, I mean, my personal opinion is we should be extending for more time. Um, and uh, it needs to be, I think, until the end of the year, just because they are not close to, to, to making up uh, you know, what they've uh, lost over the last 15 months. So that's just my personal opinion, whether our chamber will take that position or not, we'll see. But I just, just from what I've been able to gather from the restaurant tours, it's still very, been very difficult and they're still trying to catch up. So. <clears throat> How about the other businesses? Same there, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're having troubles too. Yeah, yeah, everyone is, yeah, right, yeah, no, so. Um, I'm just speaking from their perspective. So, great. Uh, any other comments? Just one thing with regard to the city of Pleasanton. <coughs> I feel like they've really been bashed, and my friend Pamela Ott, I think, is still on this call. <laughs> they did respond incredibly effectively and rapidly and quickly mm -hmm. when COVID hit to help the restaurants down mm -hmm. yes, yeah. they, they did not drag their feet. Yeah. and. It's so, I, I, I get how hard it is in, in politics to get stuff done, but they did a stellar job of helping those restaurants get open. They did. So. Agreed. Yay, Pam. Mike, do you have a they comment? Yeah, I see people. you've uh, took Karen your mute off. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna jump in. No, I, I, no, I agree with that, that the city and, and uh, the, the city did, I mean, we got a lot of things done. I mean, the restaurants were really hurting and my, I guess my only thing coming out of this is, um, you know, as was indicated kind of earlier, um, we've learned a lot, you know, about moving everything to the outside. And we've learned some, some things that we could probably implement on a go forward basis. And then we've probably um, learned some things that, that, you know, we did in an emergency and, and that wasn't so good. So um, I, I would just like to keep the, uh, the exchange um, open and I think you know the parklets and the move to the sidewalks are, are you know kind of the same thing um, you know and it works some places and it doesn't work um, and, and and anyway we learned a lot here and we and I think that we should kind of keep an open mind to maybe moving forward with some of the things that that were aesthetically pleasing and effective for the restaurants and like um, like was said earlier, you know, I think most of us are, we've probably eaten outside a heck of a lot more in the last six months than we have the last six years. Um, <clears throat> and that's something that we wouldn't have known, uh, you know, if we weren't in a pandemic situation. So I just like to, uh, you know, to try and learn from it and try and benefit from it. And, and I do agree that the restaurants, um, they're not just uh, attacked by the COVID, but there, there is a labor shortage. Um, I mean, they're, they're getting pinched, you know, from a lot of other things, um, other than, you know, just their, you know, what are they going to do in October, you know, when the weather turns or whatever. I mean, they've got, they've got other issues that they're trying to get through too. So, uh, but I, but I agree. I, I think Pam and, and the city did move. Um, they moved swiftly and effectively and all the restaurant tours, at least the ones that were the landlords for, um, you know, they, they, they're still there and, uh, they were able to hang on in large part because of, uh, the city, the city's actions, the communities cooperate. I mean, everybody got behind them, and and uh, I mean, we did have a sense of you know we're all in this together, and it worked. So, thank you, uh, um, Bill. Do you have a comment? I see your mute's off. Uh, or you just you wanted to say hi? No, everybody's covered all the comments. Really, it's, it's the sensitivity of the restaurants that I have. You know, it's a, everyone looks like oh, everything's back and everything's fantastic, and there's lines at the restaurants. Um, but a lot of these restaurants are closed in two days a week and three days a week because they don't have the staff to run them. We're like everyone else in the staff situation. It's, and it doesn't look like there's much of an end to it coming soon. So I just want to be sensitive to that, that economic piece that they're just trying, they're struggling, they're still struggling. It might look like they got some people sitting outside in those tables, but you know, it's difficult to serve all your people and you're turning people away. And I just want to be sensitive to that, to that, that economic piece. And so it was covered, but, um, and, and it's the city's been fantastic in all kinds of ways. 
And, uh, and, and we appreciate that too. And that, that, that relationship, I think I like what Mike said about learning from the things that, you know, that worked for us and things that didn't and, and moving on and making and intelligent decisions moving forward. But some type of architectural design that says this is, you know, fits with downtown Pleasanton. This is an idea of what we should look like. Um, I think those are ideas that should be explored uh, to see what kind of additional support we can give those downtown. <clears throat> Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I got to just jump in. My experience is I'm every day trying to get office space. I got a tax preparer that's 50 years in the same location, 1,600 square feet, 1,500. And I don't have any prospects, hardly, person that are seriously ready to move into that space. Um, Livermore, it, you know, vacant. And I have a car dealer in a space since 2013. And you call the planning department and say, oh, it's not zoned for a, a, a car dealer. It, so 24 people have called want to put a car dealer back in that space. And it's like the planning says no. So when government is sort of anti-business, the, the approach, it's how do you, you know, people that retired said oh gary i wanted to start a business after i retired but i'm leaving the state so we either foster business encourage business or we chase it out and and right now it is so bad at least for office space um we, we really got to rethink this do we want tax dollars you know we want to build apartments here's my other campaign build condos for tax revenue and, and equity we talk about equity build a hundred unit make it condominiums that people can a lady in Pleasanton, 72 years old, retired, still working. I rented her space cheap just so she can keep doing eBay sales. So what was the salon is now a warehouse. And she got her $80 rent increase in senior housing only. And he's her, sitting right next to you. Can't, you can't control him. He's sitting right next to you. <laughs> so Bill, we're going to put you in a government, we're going to put you in an apartment and then no. pay the rent on your social We're security check. We're talking about check. downtown here. Well, yeah, 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 I know. Let's talk about downtown. So, Something else. Sorry I, to, thank you. Yeah, 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 all right. Yeah. I, I did have uh, a foster business or not. That's, yeah, well, that's, yeah, I got one more thing, Steve. Just on, and, and Mike alluded to it earlier. Livermore did something so great and invested in their downtown that they had lots of people who wanted to be there. And then, the, then the then the, the landlords can pick and choose who they want to be as tenants if they follow you know, they follow the code pieces. But that's what they did, right? They made it so lucrative downtown that everybody wants to be there. Um, and that's what uh, Pleasanton, it seems like the, we need Pleasanton to kind of grab that and grasp that and, and invest in this downtown and make it a place where businesses want to be there. We're not just eliminating them by regulation, but we're bringing them because they want to be there. And then we, then, the, then the landlords would have many more choices of who can be there because they have, they have demand. All right, good. Well, I, we're getting a little behind our schedule here. I just want to thank you, Ellen, for yeah, coming and, and asking for our input. We appreciate great, great input, and, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to further discussion on both of these items uh, over the next few, few weeks and, and months. Great, and thank you, Shwana, for your PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I'm, I, our meeting is adjourned. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Great day, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Boy, it hurt. Are we going to go to the... Uh,